Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Bob Moran of Reno, Nevada, a young man who appeared once before on our program with the films of his Solo Safari, an exciting, punishing journey that took him from the jungles of Burma to the burning deserts of the Middle East. Now here's Bob to introduce his latest adventure. How do you do? What Jack has called my adventure is really the story of 16 men who spent 11 days challenging a stretch of river 17 miles long. That's right, 11 days to travel just 17 miles. But these were 17 miles that none of us who participated will ever forget. This is our story, the run of the Rio Grijalva. Jack Douglas True Television Series in association with Bing Crosby Productions. Across the Seven Seas, combining the different worlds of travel and adventure. And presenting tonight, Adventure, the fascinating exploits of modern day Marco Polos. This is our first destination, the city of Tuxtla, capital of the state of Chiapas, Mexico. Jack Curry, the leader and planner of this expedition, is first off the plane. Jack had recruited the rest of us, 16 in all, from throughout the United States. Except for myself, they were all expert river rats. At the airport terminal, we were greeted by a marimba band. We checked in at a local hotel in Tuxtla, but the very next day, Jack set out on an aerial reconnaissance of the Rio Grijalva Rapids. As the unofficial photographer for Jack's outfit, Western Rivers Expeditions of Salt Lake City, I was invited to go along. The Rio Grijalva cuts through the Sumadero Canyon, and at this point, I'd like to make this clear. Except for 17 miles of deadly rapids, the Rio Grijalva has been thoroughly navigated and explored. But those 17 treacherous miles have defied all who have tried, including the army of Cortez. Many of the world's best known river rats have come here, and after one look, have left without even making a run. Jack Curry was determined not only to make the run, but to see it through to the finish. That same afternoon, Jack and Art Singleton of Los Angeles took a closer look from the rim of the canyon. It's typical of Jack Curry that at no time during these preliminary explorations did he deceive himself or us. From whatever altitude, everything he saw spelled trouble, and he knew and so advised us. He was able to chart the first few miles of rapids, but no more. The Sumadero Canyon doesn't lend itself to walking. Weeks before, Jack had sent one of his trucks from Salt Lake City to Tuxla, loaded with all of our necessary gear and supplies. We drove the truck to a sort of beach just outside Tuxla and a few miles upriver from the canyon. This would be our starting point. This rig would be used to support the ore locks, as we'll see in just a moment. Now, if my terminology isn't 100% perfect, I hope you river rats in the audience will forgive me. I don't pretend to be an expert. I'm just a guy who went along for the ride. And what a ride it turned out to be. We would use three giant rubber rafts for the run as the greenhorn, I was drafted to inflate the rafts. Fortunately, Art and some of the others took pity on a greenhorn and shipped in. Otherwise, I'd still be on that riverbank pumping. Inflated, each of these giant rubber rafts weighs about 900 pounds. That's right, 900 pounds without any gear. It took a lot of manpower to carry the raft to the water. This helicopter signaled the arrival of the governor of the state of Chiapas. He had known of our plans to challenge the 17-mile stretch of rapids, and he had arranged to have this helicopter maintain daily contact with our expedition. Here's the governor wishing Jack Godspeed on our journey. On the right are newspaper reporters from Tuxla. Naturally, our expedition had generated considerable local interest. The mayor of Tuxla also came to see us off and presented Art with a rifle and shells as a token gift. Each of the three rafts had been christened, the crocodile, misspelled by the way, El Sumadero, and Grijalva. Once the rafts were in the water, we loaded our gear and supplies. We also carried one small raft for emergency purposes. Here's that oarlock rig chained into position. 
Life jackets were a must, and there would be no exceptions. Those were Jack Curry's orders, and they were faithfully carried out. Contrary to what a few people may think, river rats are not a bunch of nuts anxious to get to heaven. At last we shove off, and Jack takes the oars of the lead raft. We'll pass under that bridge, Chiapa de Corso Bridge. Even the bridge was lined with spectators. More spectators along the banks of the river, all of them wishing us luck, and most of them thinking we were crazy. We drifted downstream and under the bridge, and we drifted slowly. The current is very mild at this point, and we had all we could do to stay awake instead of dozing off. Later in the afternoon, we hit white water, and this was my first taste of it. As far as the others were concerned, all of them experienced men, this was kid stuff. But being a novice, I thought it was a big thrill. The first of the really dangerous rapids lay ahead, and Jack had us pull ashore to make camp, figuring that this would give us time to reconnoiter the rapids. Remember, we were pioneering this stretch of the Rio Grijalva, therefore we were not able to benefit by someone else's experience. That first night, we just loafed around. Physically, we were as fresh as daisies. All we had done was drift downriver about two miles. But the tensions of the weeks of waiting and planning were still with us, and making early camp helped to quiet us down. Early to bed is early to rise. Too early, if you ask me, because it was mighty chilly around 6 a.m. And even the tantalizing aroma of eggs on the griddle didn't stop the shivers. But by the time we had sandpapered the dishes, that old Mr. Sun just poured out his warm blessings, gratefully received by all. So we're on the river above the first rapids, which we named Dead Horse Falls because of the skeleton of a horse we had found near camp the night before. We had to bypass Dead Horse Falls, not only because it was mostly a giant cataract, but also because it was almost immediately followed by another falls. As I was to learn, when two major rapids are too close to each other, there isn't time in between to get the boats squared away properly. They're totally unmanageable. So we had to line the boats past the rapids. By lining, I mean that we had to empty the boats, then attach lines to them, and have the empty boats go over the rapids. Meanwhile, I had crossed the opposite bank to take pictures of this churning mass of water, which we named Paul's Falls. You'll understand why in just a moment. All right, the rafts have been emptied, the lines made secure, and the first of the rafts is allowed to go over the rapids. The second raft also makes it. Now, our first major setback. Watch these slow motion films, and you'll see the raft smash against the rocks, losing its oar lock rigging. the third raft, Jack and Paul Thevenin crossed the stream in the small auxiliary raft in order to pick me up. I got into the raft, and suddenly in midstream, the raft turned over. All three of us were swept toward the falls. Jack latched onto a rock and pulled himself ashore. The raft got caught between rocks just above the falls, and although I lost my camera in the rapids, I was fortunately pushed against the raft. These pictures of me were taken by another member of the expedition who also had a camera. But hear this, Paul Thevenin had been carried over the falls and miraculously had managed to make the opposite shore. Of course, I didn't know this at this particular moment. Once I had been pulled safely ashore, we went after Paul. You'll see him big as life in just a second. And how he managed to stay alive, we'll never know. His forehead was viciously gashed. He busted an eardrum and he was battered and bruised, but good. Bob Preston did his duty, a big dose of penicillin after first attending to his scalp and ear. The hand of death has passed us by. Now we turn again to the first disaster. The crocodile is useless. 
Eight of her air compartments are smashed beyond repair. We salvage what we can and pack our gear aboard the two remaining rafts. More lining at Matterhorn Falls, this time with men aboard. One of the boats rams against the rocks and watch Art Fenstermaker waving frantically for more line to release the raft before it swamps. He got the line, then we quickly pulled the raft to shore to make sure that it didn't take on any more water. Still, Bill Dumar had a lot of bailing to do, and he was mighty disgusting, and rightfully so. Later, the chore of wringing out his clothes, and only after he had taken off his t-shirt did he realize, and we realized, that he had a severe rope burn, a good eight inches long. There's one consolation about river running. There's always enough water for the Saturday night ritual. This is a luxury I could rarely afford in the deserts of the Middle East. In camp that night, there was a great deal of horseplay, more than any other night of the trip. It was strictly a front. Each of us trying to hide from one another our discouragement and the fear that we might not make it. We worried about the loss of crocodile and how it might cripple our chances. So we worried and hid our worry with horseplay. Silly things, perhaps, but it lets off tension and keeps men going. Not until the sixth day did we reach rapids that we felt we could shoot with at least a 50-50 chance of surviving. So we named these rapids First Ride Rapids. These are slow motion films showing the first raft running the rapids. Here's what the ride looks like from the raft. of sweeping over first ride rapids soon vanished. The next rapids were impassable. Not even a fish could have survived. This meant portaging. And if you've never been on a river run with two 900 pound rafts plus equipment, you can't possibly imagine what it's like to portage through the Sumadero Canyon. These scenes will give you some idea why we dreaded portaging. It's a living hell. After busting our backs, inching the rafts up the cliff, this almost seemed like fun. The assembly line that gets our equipment back in the rafts. On the seventh day, more trouble. Alan Weber's sprained ankle has swollen, and we now fear a serious leg injury. The helicopter that has checked us daily is signaled in, and Alan is taken to Tuxla for treatment. We have no way of knowing whether he will be able to rejoin us to finish the run. And indeed, even we don't know how the adventure will end. The co-pilot gets out, Alan painfully stumbles in, and later the helicopter will return for the co-pilot. Incidentally, the pilot of the helicopter did a tremendous job of getting in and out of this narrow, steep canyon. By now, the strain was beginning to tell. Some of us were physically sick, a few were mentally depressed but all of us were determined to conquer that 17 miles of river and rapids. In a moment, part two of our story. Always the ever-present river and more rapids without a name. Later, we named this stretch of rapids Rainbow Rapids. This one was a fun rapid. We took on a little water, but it was a very easy rapid to shoot. Jack's big smile here is the site of the nicest and cleanest stretch of beach we had seen since leaving Tuxla. Yes, we gave this beach a name too, Rainbow Beach. Incidentally, these names will now be officially designated on the maps of the Rio Grijalva. 
By long-standing tradition, this is the honor and courtesy extended to all trailblazers. Just a few feet from the river's edge, we could look up, way, way up, and see a veil of water falling in a spray. And at just the right time of day, this spray from the waterfall reflects a rainbow. Unfortunately, I couldn't catch the rainbow with my camera, but these rainbow reflections are what prompted us to use the word rainbow in naming the rapids, the beach, and in fact, the waterfall itself. Here, I'm savoring the delicious taste of fresh rainfall water washed down from the limestone cliffs. Now, here's an interesting natural phenomenon created by the rainfall spray, the miniature city of sand skyscrapers. Here's what happens. The falling drops of water wash away the sand from the sides of pieces of debris, such as a twig, for example. The twig or leaf or stick stays on top, and the sand underneath assumes the same contour. And so, Mother Nature plays architect and designs a model city by the banks of a remote Mexican river. To the right of the miniature city is a stretch of sand that we named Crocodile Beach. We saw five different trails left by the crocs, and here, clearly defined in the sand, the resting places of the departed reptiles. This churning, twisting torrent of white water was our introduction to Gorilla Gorge. We named these Lee's Rapids in honor of Tom Lee, one of our boatmen. This is fast water, very fast, and we debated the wisdom of making the run. Jack Curry had final responsibility, and he decided the rapids could be had. Here's the gorge, just a slit in the rock. And here comes the first raft. The film is slow motion. Now the second raft also seen in slow motion, which will give you an idea as to the speed of the current. This shows how little room we had to go through the opening, a matter of a few feet to spare. back at Gorilla Gorge and glad that it's behind us. Once through the opening, the river seemed to calm down, but not for long. Four of our most experienced river rats, including Big John Cross and Art Fenstermaker, decided to shoot Fenstermaker Falls. They took both rafts over these falls and in so doing saved us a full day of portaging. After the storm, and lucky for us, the river had turned placid and allowed us to make for the beach. One of the rafts was badly torn up and had to be patched up. As you can see, it was quite a patch job. A section of the oarlock frame had also been shattered. Fortunately, we hadn't lost the shattered fragments, so that Jack and Art and Ralph Whitford were able to accomplish a terrific repair job. We made an early camp, but ate very little, being more tired than hungry. Incidentally, Jack had planned our food rations well. We had plenty of chow. The next morning, we shot Preston Rapids. It's more of a fall than a rapid, but we didn't have much time to debate the point. Here we go. One of the oars was lost, but quickly and skillfully replaced by one of the oarsmen in order to keep the raft under control. We had good reason to make for the shore, a breathtaking waterfall which we named Preston Falls, one of the most beautiful waterfalls I've ever seen, a foaming yet silky sheet of water dropping in stages some 200 feet down the mountainside. 
Again, we asked ourselves, as we had so often, who else has passed this way before us, if anyone? We have no way of knowing for certain. But I am fairly certain that these are the first films ever made of these falls, or for that matter, most of the other rapids are falls. The spray falls into the river. In fact, after we shot Preston Rapids, the current took us directly under the spray of the falls. We spent several hours here admiring the falls from every vantage point. In the next 48 hours, more rapids, more trouble, more portage, more rapids. And by now, we were a beat up bunch. This is dead end rock where the opening is only three and a half feet wide less than half the beam of our rafts. So, more portaging. The helicopter checked us out, but couldn't help. However, the pilot gave us good news. This was the last obstacle. We had made it. Once past this point, he told us we would reach the village of Chikwa Sen. It was almost a pleasure to portage. We had made it. 17 miles of rapids in 11 days. White water ahead, but very mild, and soon signs of civilization, cattle. A native dugout and a friendly wave. This would be our last beachhead, and the native grapevine didn't take long. Villagers began to gather just as soon as we reached the beach. We were glad to see them. The women and children seemed puzzled and were quite reserved. But the men apparently understood what we had accomplished and greeted us warmly. The men led us to the village, and of course we had to tell our story over and over again. They were spellbound, and we on the other hand found it strange to realize that these people who live on the banks of the Grijalva had never seen the 17 miles of it just above their village. In the afternoon, we returned to the beach to start packing our equipment and attend to our bruises and injuries. Doc Preston was certainly kept busy that whole afternoon. None of us really realized just how battered we were. My only wound came from patching my pants. The governor flew into town to greet us, landing his helicopter in the center of the empty village square. He was genuinely pleased with our success and gratified that there had been no loss of life in connection with the expedition. Jack's Western Expeditions truck, which had remained at Tuxla, was directed to the village by the helicopter pilots. We put our gear in the truck and bumped our way back to the capital city where the governor was again on hand to greet us, this time in his official capacity. They had quite a reception committee, including the airport marimba band. Men will be boys, especially when they've emerged from tension and pressure, so we put on a show of our own. This was more like it, and I sure hope that our wives or girlfriends will understand. That evening, we were treated to a folk dance exhibition at a dinner by the governor in our honor. Finally, urged on by the governor and the other officials, the river rats took to the floor. You know, as I took these pictures, I remember thinking to myself, are these smiling, clean-shaven, well-dressed guys the same men I knew the day before? Bless them, they were indeed, and I'll remember every one of them as long as I live. Homeward bound, and a last look at the Rio Grijalva. From this day on, no river rat could say, there's a 17-mile stretch of rapids in Mexico that's never been taken. We won't be the last, but we'll always know that we were the first. During our 11 days on the Rio Grijalva, I saw many examples of inspirational courage and fortitude. But in the final analysis, I'll have to tip my hat to Jack Curry, who planned and led the expedition. He's all man and every inch the born leader. My thanks to Jack Curry for including me in the expedition. And thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. <laughs>